Welcome to Staying Connected Energy Literacy Training for Frontline Community Services Workers. I'm Cynthia Townley from TASCOS and my colleague Anton Vickstrom from Sustainable Living Tasmania will be presenting these workshops in four modules. The workshops are designed and developed by TASCOS and Sustainable Living and funded by the Tasmanian Government through the Climate Change Office. We're presenting these modules because in Tasmania energy bills are one of the challenges faced by many low income and vulnerable households. The bills are large, they come every three months and in winter they're particularly large. Winter bills are a serious problem for Tasmanian households, partly because in Tasmania we have lower incomes than the rest of Australia, but also because our houses tend to be of poor quality, they're older houses, often weatherboard, often with little insulation, and so heating those, those houses is very expensive for people. So we've developed a set of workshops for frontline community services workers to help clients to stay warm in winter and also to stay connected if they have challenges with their energy bills. The workshops have four modules. The first one is about the energy in Tasmania, the supply chain for electricity and for gas. The second module is about tariffs and electricity bills, how to read them, what you can learn and why that's useful. The third module is about how to use energy better in your home to stay warm and to save money. And finally, we'll talk about the support and assistance that's available for people when they have trouble with their energy bills. The electricity supply chain is basically how the electricity gets from where it's made to where it's used in households. It matters because all of the elements in the electricity supply chain go towards making the cost of the bill. That is, that's all the elements that you pay for when you pay your bill finally back to Aurora. Electricity starts with generation. In Tasmania, Hydro Tasmania is in control of the generation and most of it, as the name suggests, comes from the big dams. There's also a little bit of wind power and a little bit of gas electricity that comes through the hydro. The hydro is also responsible for purchasing electricity through BassLink. Usually that comes from generation in Victoria and that's typically been um, coal-fired generation. Hydro Tasmania is owned by the Tasmanian government. The next step in the supply chain is transmission and distribution. That's to say poles and wires. How the poles and wires work is there's the really, the really big poles, really big wires, really big towers, that's transmission. And then the smaller poles and wires, the ones that we see in the streets outside our homes, that's the distribution. In Tasmania, both of those are combined into one network service, that's TAS Networks. TAS Networks is also owned by the Tasmanian government. The next step in the supply chain is the retailer, and this is Aurora. Um, we're all familiar with Aurora, they send the bills. Effectively their role is to purchase the power from the generator and the distribution delivery services from TAS Networks and then capture all of those costs as well as the costs of running their own business and provide the bill to the consumer, the household bill. As well as that in the supply chain, there's a little bit of extra uh, energy that's generated by solar rooftops, rooftop um, panels. And that goes, that when that's not used in the households themselves, that goes back into the grid and it becomes part of the distribution. Effectively, all of the elements in the supply chain belong to the government in Tasmania. Um, Hydro is owned by the government, TAS Network is owned by the government, and Aurora is owned by the government. In other states, the retailers and the generators can be owned by different entities. They're not all owned by the, by the, um, by the public. In your bill, the cost is made up of the elements that come from um, each of these each of these supply chain elements. So, in uh, about in, in 2016, here's the approx here's the approximate electricity cost breakdown. Round about half of it comes from the network. So that's the poles and wires, and they're expensive because first of all, there's a lot of poles and a lot of wires and a lot of towers, and they've all got to be maintained and looked after and replaced when necessary, or new ones built when necessary. Um, about half of the cost of electricity comes from the network. Another, maybe a quarter to a third of the cost of electricity is the wholesale of the generation. So this is what um, what it costs hydro to produce the power, and. This is, um, again, this is going to vary according to exactly what the price is and also how much is used, but about, maybe about a third, a quarter to a third of the bill 
comes from the hydro generation. The next element in the bill is round about 12-13%. Um, that's your retail cost and this is the cost of Aurora running its own business, um, answering the questions that come to it, generating the bills, doing all that kind of work. Um, there's another smaller proportion again, 5.6% roundabout, that goes to the Commonwealth Government's renewable energy certificate charges. There's a small amount of metering, round about 2 to 3%. That goes to the cost of having the meters um, on each of the properties. Um, at the moment, TAS Networks looks after the meters and reads the meters, owns the meters and takes care of it. But over time, that's going to be transitioned into a what's called a contestable space. So we might get other operators in the state uh, come the end of 2017. Um, there's a small amount that's skimmed off the bill that's called for market charges, and that's about half a percent, 0.04 percent, give or take. Um, what that does is that also that supports the national energy network, and that's important because part of our uh, part of our energy supply chain is, involves BasLink, so it's so it's part of the national electricity market. But the national electricity market also sets some standards for what retailers can and should do. Also sets some of the safety standards as well as the economic standards. So those are the main elements in the electricity supply chain that go up to the cost of the bill. Another important feature of all of, all of those elements of electricity supply is that they're regulated. All of the parts of the electricity supply are regulated for safety and security and all of those important things. They're also regulated for the economic costs. In Tasmania, uh, because we have monopoly businesses, only a single operator in each of those areas, that is the, um, the wholesale, the transmission distribution networks and the retail, um, there's no natural competition in the space, so there's regulation to make sure that the prices aren't excessive and the profits to those businesses aren't excessive. The networks, and this is true for all states in Australia, the networks are regulated by the National the National Energy Regulator, that's called the Australian Energy Regulator, or AER, and all of the revenues to networks, um, including the TAS, the TAS networks, are regulated there at a national level. In Tasmania, the wholesale price and the retail price are also regulated. Um, Hydro Tasmania prices are regulated by the Tasmanian Economic Regulator, uh, and the retail price, that is the part of the price that Aurora Energy can charge for its own costs to provide service to customers and also its, its profit or retail margin, are uh, also set by the Tasmanian Economic Regulator. What this means is that the, uh, while the costs might vary and they might go up and down over time, there is a, an element of oversight for those costs because they're not going to be constrained by competition in a marketplace because there's only single operators in Tasmania. In Tasmania, some households also have gas supplied through a supply chain. Not all households that use gas use a, a supply chain that I'm about to describe. If you get your gas in bottles or um, you know, in, in, in gas canisters, that's a different system altogether, so I'm putting that aside for now. What I'm talking about is when gas comes through pipes to the household. And here, the supply chain looks very similar to the supply chain for electricity. First of all, you have the uh, large production, the wholesale producers. Then you have transmission, big pipes, distribution, smaller pipes. That is the network that delivers from the production to the, to the consumer, um, the household. And then you have a retailer. In Tasmania, we actually have two retailers. Aurora Gas uh, is one of our gas retailers and Tas Gas Retail is the second gas retailer. And they do the same role that they do in the electricity uh, supply chain. They consolidate all of the prices together, all of the costs from wholesale, from transmission and distribution, and their own costs of their own business, and then put a final bill out to households. The significant difference in the gas supply chain and the gas consumer environment in Tasmania is that while gas is regulated for safety, it is not economically regulated. So there is no uh, oversight from an, a board like the Tasmanian Energy Regulator, Tas sorry, the Tasmanian Economic Regulator, uh, that has oversight over the gas, the wholesale price for gas, or of the, um, the retail profit margin for gas in Tasmania. 
the consequence is that gas consumers probably uh, have the potential to be more exposed to, a fluctu to fluctuating prices. Um, the other issue that we see in, in that unregulated environment is that the consumer protections aren't quite as strong for gas, gas consumers. One of the critical matters there is that whereas in electricity under the, um, under the regulated system, there is an obligation to supply. For a consumer in Tasmania, if you want to go and sign up to Aurora Energy to get the electricity connected, you will get the electricity connected. Um, it might be disconnected later if you don't pay your bill, but they can't decide ahead of time that you're not a good credit risk. That's a little bit different for gas. It's up to the gas retailer, whether it's um, Aurora Gas or, or Tasgas Retail, um, it's up to them to say that they want to supply you or not. And they can choose if you're, for example, understood to considered to be a bad credit risk, they can choose not to supply you with gas. This has problems for people who move into houses with uh, a gas supply there, um, because then they're going to find an essential service to them, which is for their cooking, for their hot water and for their heating, uh, they may not actually be able to find a supplier who will deliver it. And this is, um, at this point in time, when we're making the recording, that is at April 2017, that problem exists. We would be very hopeful it will change over time, but we've yet to see a change in that space. And that's, um, that's one of the critical differences between gas supply and the, the, the lack of regulation in that space. So what does your electricity bill say? It's a good question. There's heaps of information in there, lots of lines of data, little graphs, uh, complicated little payment options, and hopefully we can help demystify that. Before we go on, we'll talk about kilowatt hours, which is the unit of measurement for your electricity. So first of all, we start off with a watt. If you have 1000 watts, it is called a kilowatt. It's like if you have one meter and you have 1000 meters, it's called a kilometer. Now, 1,000 watts or 1 kilowatt is about what a kettle uses, give or take. Now, if you use the kettle for one hour, you've used one kilowatt hour of electricity. If you use your 1 kilowatt kettle for 10 hours, you've used 10 kilowatt hours of electricity. In your bill, you'll see big totals for the amount of kilowatt hours that you've used in a, in a quarter, and it might be 3,000 kilowatt hours or 30,000 kilowatt hours and they'll charge that by unit price to give you the total for your bill. Okay, we've got that out of the way. Now there's some people who don't even get bills. They're on Aurora Pay as you go. And these customers, they recharge at their local newsagent or corner store, and they put that uh, money onto their bill. They prepay instead of post-paying like most people on quarterly bills. Now there might be, there's about 56 different prices for electricity on Aurora Pay as you go. It's, it's bewildering because there's prices for summer and winter, for the middle of the day versus nighttime versus the weekend. There's also concession and non-concession rates, and there's also six different options for payment. Okay, don't get too concerned about this. There's a fact sheet that you can download from the Aurora website, which has all of those lines of data. But the big pattern is electricity is cheaper on the weekends, overnight and in the middle of the day, and more expensive uh, at breakfast and dinner. Uh, on the slide we've got up at the moment that's showing a graph showing the different prices on the weekends versus weekday and you'll see uh, between 6.30 and 11 in the morning it's, much, it's expensive as is 4.30 to 10.30 in the afternoon. Much cheaper in that overnight time 10.30 to 6.30. If you've got discretion, if you can put a, your clothes dryer on, if you need to dry clothes, put it on in the middle of the night and that way you'll be paying half the price for drying your clothes than if you're doing it uh, at those peak periods. Now for everyone else there's a, a lot more other tariffs you can be paying for electricity and the next slide showing a bunch of them. Don't be too concerned. The first two is where you'll see most of your clients and most people have a combination of tariff 31 which is light and power and tariff 41 which is heating and hot water. So light and power is things like your lights, that's pretty obvious, your power points. Also your stove, things that plug into your power points. For example, it might be your fridge or your toaster or your power tools, they're all plugging in and you're being charged 26 cents for every kilowatt hour you use on that tariff. It's also just for the pleasure of having that tariff connected to your house, you're paying about 92 cents a day. That's almost a dollar a day 
but just being connected to tariff 31. Tariff 41 is heating and hot water. That's hardwired heaters. So it's if a heat pump's wired into the wall or a pure heat heater and also electric hot water systems. That's charged at around 16 cents a kilowatt hour at the moment. Generally the prices go up a bit each year. Currently it's about 16 cents and it's 18 cents a day just to be connected to, um, to this tariff. Roughly speaking, those standing charges, the 90 cents a day and the 18 cents a day, they roughly add up to the, what the concession discount is um, if you're signing up or if you actually access a concession. So people who are on concessions, you don't really need to worry about the standing charges, you just think about the daily usage. Sometimes you get some, uh, some of your clients might be on business tariff number 22. Now these tariffs, you'll, we'll go in later, you'll see where they are written down in the actual bill and so you can actually check this out. But business tariff 22, it's like I said, it's designed for businesses. If you're in a household, you shouldn't be on this um, tariff and it's, you're only likely to be there if you're say in a residence that used to operate as a business. It might be the old corner store that's been converted or an old fish and chip shop or it might be that you're just on the main street or upstairs from a business tenancy. Uh, if you're on this tariff and you're a resident, get off it. It is more expensive and you shouldn't be paying, you're paying 26 cents a kilowatt hour for every unit of electricity you use, except for the first 500 kilowatt hours every quarter where you're paying a whopping 35 cents. So it's a big waste of money and you don't need to be connected to that. There's tariff 61 and 62, which are off peak. And therefore, often the what are called heat bank heaters, and also sometimes that people have off-peak hot water systems. Aurora isn't connecting people to this tariff anymore, uh, but it offers really cheap electricity. So if you're on it, it's probably you're on a good thing at that time. 23 cents a day as a standing charge. There's a new tariff called Tariff 93. It's called a time of use tariff. And it's structured similarly to the pay-as-you-go tariff. So in that, you remember it was cheap on the weekends, uh, late at night and in the middle of the day, more expensive at breakfast and dinner time. So the peak periods, breakfast and dinner, 31 cents a kilowatt hour, that's fairly high. In the middle of the day and on the weekends, it's 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So fairly cheap. Generally, this will suit limited customers, but it might be worthwhile investigating if you're not using electric heating and if you've got the ability to move your power consumption into the middle of the day. So perhaps you're retired, you're prepared to um, move around some of the things that you'd normally be doing at night time into the middle of the day. It could suit you. You can talk to Aurora to see if it's going to be suitable for you. The last couple I'm going to talk about today are the solar feed-in tariffs and there's two of those that you'll see. One is called the legacy feed-in tariff. So if you've got solar panel systems installed quite a long time ago, you'll be getting paid for 28 cents a kilowatt hour. If you've got a system installed more recently or today, it's around six cents a kilowatt hour. This changes up and down a little bit. Now to understand how that works is the solar panels on your roof, they generate electricity. The electricity first gets used inside your house. So if you're boiling the kettle while the sun's shining, you're going to be using the sunshine to power your kettle. If you're generating more power on your roof from the sunshine than is being used by the kettle and all the other things in your house, it gets exported to the grid. Now with the old legacy feed-in tariff, that export gets paid at 28 cents a kilowatt hour. With the new feed-in tariff, it's six cents a kilowatt hour. So the 28 cents was set up when they calculated it saying, well, you buy electricity at 28 cents, which was the price back then, well, you, if you export it, you should get 28 cents. That was considered fair. Then uh, they changed it and they came up with a new definition of fair, which was Hydro Tasmania, when they sell electricity, they roughly get paid six cents a kilowatt hour. So you're an electricity generator at home with the solar panels, so you should get paid six cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, they're the solar feed-in tariffs. Aurora Energy has a new look bill. Actually, it looks fairly similar to the old look bill to you or I, but there are some changes uh, in detail on it. It's being rolled out now, so if you get a bill in the post this week, it's probably going to look different than the last one you got. That's if you're watching this video in April 2017. 
uh, there's some changes, some simplification. And we'll go through an example of the bill um, and note that all the figures in here are just samples. So we'll your bill will look a bit different. So the first page, that red circle on the, on the presentation is the most crucial bit of information, which is how much you have to pay and when. Okay, most people only look at this information on their bill, but there's a hell of a lot more information on there if you, if you choose, to, choose to delve a bit deeper. Down the bottom, there is a section on your payment options, and that was covered in, or well, that will be covered in the session four on, um, of this series of presentations. Up the top, there's a phone number for contacting Aurora Energy if you've got any issues, want to set up payment options and so forth. This is page two, and it's like a detailed inventory of all the transactions that have happened on your account. So if you or your client just pays once a quarter, then that'll be quite a limited bit of information. If on the other hand, there's been, you're say on center pay, you're paying every fortnight into the into the bill, maybe do some extra discretionary payments. It's going a line item by line item, write down all of the different payments you've made there. So if you've got a discrepancy between your records, you should be able to look up uh, that section of the bill to, to work out what's been going on. Now on the right hand side of, of that bill there, there's a big red circle around, around it and the most Interesting information on there for this session is A is to do with your concessions, so making sure your concession eligibility and you can follow up more details there. And two about payment assistance, and that's about uh, looking to, if you're having troubles paying your bill, here's another option in. The, once again, the last session in this, uh, this series is covering payment options and, and the best way to set up your payment plans. Okay, page three. If you're an energy nerd like me, this is where it starts getting interesting. And uh, bear with us if you're not. Uh, I'll try and uh, explain some of what's going on here. Towards the top of the page here is you can see some information which is showing your energy usage in kilowatt hours against each tariff that you're using. Here's it actually says which tariffs you're on and how much you're being charged for the tariff. So back to the beginning of the presentation. Uh, this uh, person has a combination of tariff 31 and tariff 41. Now each of your clients might have a different combination. If you see tariff 22 here, start asking questions. Okay, now underneath there, there's some information which is the metering information and that shows somebody's been out to your house and they've read the electricity meter and this is where they've recorded the information and it says in total you've used 683 kilowatt hours or whatever it might be. If you have a really large number there that looks completely out of the ordinary, you can go and read your meter and see whether it matches the information that's, that's come up here. Now we're zooming into the bottom of the bill where there's some um, really interesting information as well. So it has your average daily use, so how many kilowatt hours a day you use on average at this time of the year versus the same period last year. Now it's worth noting that in winter time you're going to use more power than you do in summertime. That's normal. But being able to compare between this year and last year is hopefully you can uh, manage, manage your house or know what has changed. So hopefully you can do things in your life which actually brings down your electricity usage. But sometimes you can't and it might be uh, something bad's happened. Maybe you've hurt yourself at work and you've got to spend more time on the couch while you recuperate. Or perhaps something good's happened and you've, you've had a little baby and you've got to have them in the room, you've got to put the heater on over winter time to keep them warm. Now, each of those things is you're going to have to warm the house a bit more and your electricity usage is going to go up. Being aware of that is helpful. If none of that stuff's happened and your electricity use has jumped up, hey, perhaps you've got something wrong in the house. Perhaps the hot water cylinder's going faulty or perhaps you're, you're Teenage kids have really taken up to running the heater all the time because they've decided that's a good thing to do. It can alert you to some issues and uh, help you tackle them. At the bottom of there is a graph which shows your usage compared to the average Tasmanian household. Uh, the average Tasmanian household is by the size of the household, how many occupants, and it includes 
all sorts of Tasmanian households. It's the average. So it has Queenstown, Queenstown, um, maybe it's a weatherboard house in Queenstown or a nice double brick house in St. Helens or a shack down near Signet or a big mansion in Launceston. They're all averaged out by the number of households. Uh, we tend to find it has fairly high usage compared to uh, most houses and sometimes you'll be much, much further below. It's also worth noting that if you've got a solar power connection, this graph is incorrect. Uh, so if you've got solar power, just ignore the graph, but that your average use compared to the last year, that still holds true. If someone who comes in with some problems, it's being able to look at a bill and work out some information, say for example, is it because your heating has spiked? Suddenly there's a lot more heating used. Or is it that your hot water system's gone on the blink and is now leaking and is using a lot more power? Or is it something else? And, and there's a few little sums that can help you uh, dive down into the bill a bit more. It's not very complicated on the math, so let's give it a shot. Now the whole premise of these sums is, is this, and it's you use more power in winter because it's cold, okay? So the most likely, there's generally the winter bill is often about twice as much as the summer bill, and that's most likely going to be from using extra heating. Now it might be in one of your Tara 41, which is a hardwired heater and a hot water cylinder. You can tell the difference between the summer and winter bill is likely how much you've run your, your electric heater. That's probably what the difference is. The actual summer bill, that usage, is probably just the hot water cylinder. So you can go, oh, that's probably just what we're using for hot water across the rest of the period. And the same thing goes for your um, plug-in heaters on your Tariff 31. Whatever, you, you've got your summer usage, which is standard. Anything that you're using extra in winter is probably going to be a plug-in heater or it might be a clothes dryer as well. They're normally the two things which you'd expect to see being used more. Now, if you've broken your leg, had a baby, those other things that I've, I've said have changed, this sum's not going to work so well. If you've bought a brand new energy efficient fridge and put insulation in the roof and a bunch of other things, these sums are, are, are not so useful. But let, let's keep on diving in. If you have a summer bill and a winter bill, you can go and kind of highlight the information and just work out how many kilowatt hours were used on each of those bills. So get the bills, get the highlighter out and highlight these, these bits of information. Uh, kilowatt hour usage for, or your energy charge for tariff 31 and tariff 41 for both summer and winter bills. So how much did my hardwired heater use? So you can get there and write down your winter bill and in this example was 3,600 kilowatt hours. Your summer bill on tariff 41, 1,000 kilowatt hours. You take 1,000 away from 3,600, 2,600 kilowatt hours. That's how much your hard wire heater used over winter or that quarter in winter. And if you charge that by the rate for that tariff and we went through before it was six, around 16 cents every kilowatt hour. 2,600 times by 0.16, it's around $416 to run this heater in this example. It wasn't so hard, was it? It's a simple sum. Now, for your plug-in heater and clothes dryer, it's the same sum, exactly the same, except we're using the information from tariff 31. So we do the same thing. In this example, it's 1,500 kilowatt hours in winter. It's 800 kilowatt hours in summer. That the difference is 700 kilowatt hours. This electricity is more expensive on this tariff. So it's 26 cents every kilowatt hour. So the total in this example is $182 for the three months over winter as a plug-in heater and dryer. Cool, okay. Now we're on to the last one. And this is the, this is the most simple one, which is how much is my hot water usage? And simply with this one, it's how much electricity was used on tariff 41 in summertime times by the charge for that power which is 16 cents again and this example is it's using 80 dollars for three months um, over summer that's just the electricity usage it doesn't use 
None of this is putting in the standing charges or what have you. Okay, so there's some simple calculations. Use them as you will. Sometimes they are incorrect, but they give you a good ballpark, a, a good um, entry point into working with your client and seeing what might be going on. Perhaps the hot water usage is really high or the plug-in heat is really high in different periods of the year, and that way you can compare and contrast. So that's the end of the section on uh, reading an electricity bill. Welcome to the third module of this training session, which is about energy saving, tips and tricks to save money in your home. So first of all, before we can save energy and save some money, we need to know where the, where the power is going. And it's roughly half of the heating in a house over the course of a year goes into heating the house. So that might be a wood heater or electric heater or gas, but half of that energy that's going into the house is spent on heating. About another quarter in the average Tasmanian house is used in uh, for hot water. So hot water for showers, might be washing, washing dishes and so forth. Then there's the last quarter is uh, taken up with everything else. So there's a small component for cooking, about 9%, lights, 4%. That's a tiny little sliver, isn't it, lighting? Uh, refrigeration and, and everything else. So the big picture is half is heating. We've got to spend a lot of time focusing on how to uh, keep heat in better, and as well as using better forms of heat, and as well looking at the efficiency of our hot water systems. They're the big items. Let's focus on them first. Now, here's some Inuit people. What are they doing? They're dressing appropriately for their climate. And that's what we need to do in winter time, is making sure that we're not uh, attempting to keep ourselves warm in shorts and a singlet. Well, you can, you can attempt to keep yourself uh, in the lightweight clothing, but it'll cost a lot more to heat. So if you're looking to save money on your power bills, it's about wearing warm clothes throughout winter. And that means you need to run your heater less to stay comfortable. So it's really important things thermals, layers, and also having warm socks. Another one is there's a lot of uh, heat loss through the head, so sometimes a beanie is appropriate. Of course, you don't have to do this, but the more you can do about personal heating, is the less heat you need to put into a room. There's another big element, which is looking around your house is they can be quite leaky. We've got lots of old houses, um, lots of gaps under doors, around window frames and so on. So I was looking at how you can make the space that you're using as warm as possible. So we look for detecting, uh, to detect air gaps and drafts and so on. Good way is using an incense stick. Um, so you use the stick on a, if it's a windy day outside, close all the doors, light an incense stick, and you can see where the wind's blowing, where the smoke's blowing, where the actual draft's coming from. So it's often I'm looking around exhaust fans, down lights, uh, other problems are around skirting boards, uh, as well as windows and doors. And there's a range of products which you can use to, to seal them up, but the key thing is just blocking the gap. So however you achieve that, that's what you need to do. Now another important one is, we have that personal heating, keeping ourselves warm, and the other one is trying to heat the smallest possible space we can. And for that, we look at zoning the home. So it's reducing the amount of areas we're trying to heat. Instead of trying to heat every room in the house, perhaps we're just trying to keep the lounge room and dining room warm. So yeah, it's important to, to zone the home for heating. Door snakes, doors, or even a curtain, um, especially in two-story houses. Sometimes if people are living downstairs, having a curtain between the downstairs and the upstairs area can really help uh, consolidate the areas you're trying to heat. Okay. Another element in your home is about curtains. Uh, curtains and pelmets for that matter. So the windows in the house are often the, the worst performing component of the home. They're beautiful to look out, they let in lots of beautiful light. However, there are really thin bits of glass, glass conducts heat. So we're losing a lot of heat through our windows. So in that situation is making sure we've got good quality thick curtains, preferably with the thermal lining and as well pelmets. And pelmets are a little cap that sits on top of your curtain. And the cap on top of the curtain stops uh, an air current circulating around, uh, around that area. So 
We've looked at how to keep ourselves warmer in a little space, so draft proofing. We've looked at, well, I should have included insulation in that matter, as well as curtains. Now we're going to look at when you actually have to pay for heat to go into a space, how much is it costing you? And here we've got a variety of electric heating sources in this graph. Uh, and what it shows is different electric heating sources have different performance and they also are on different tariffs. So the three on the left are all electric heating on um, normal uh, houses with a quarterly bill. And you see the, the most expensive is a plug-in heater on tariff 31. And that's because plug-in heaters are only ever 100% efficient and it's also because tariff 31 is more expensive for your power. So currently it's 25 or 26 cents a kilowatt hour compared to say tariff 41 where we've got another heater which is at about 16 cents a kilowatt hour for the electricity. So almost double the price for running a similar heater. This is calculated based on every kilowatt hour of energy provided. Some heaters have a bigger capacity so they put more heat into a room but this is basically uh, a graph on the same equivalent amount of heat going into a space. And from this, we can see the heat pump on tariff 41. People say heat pumps are really efficient. This is why, they cost a lot less to run. And really what they're doing is they're harvesting energy from the outside environment, heat from the atmosphere, and pumping it into your room. Uh, compared to a uh, pure heat or a column heater, which are basically like big kettles or big toasters. They're just a resistive element radiating heat. On the right hand side of this graph, we can see a bunch of pay-to-go customers. Now, once again, you can see that plug-in, well, the difference here is plug-in and hardwire heaters are the same cost to run. There is no differential heating tariff between the two, um, but it also shows that heat pumps are conventionally a lot cheaper to run. So if you have the opportunity to be using a heat pump, do that in preference to any of the other forms of electric heating. Thermostats can really help in your home. So thermostats might be like this, a remote control unit, or they might be uh, attached to your heater at the wall or wherever it's installed. And they enable you to set a temperature and keep it like that and avoids what we call the pickled or the boiled frog syndrome. It's where we turn up the heater really high when we get home and it gets warmer and warmer and we're taking off clothes and we're dripping sweat and we haven't really noticed and we're overheating our house. And when you're overheating your house, you're spending more money on your power. And there's a rule of thumb that says for every degree warmer you go in your house, it's costing you 10% more on your heating bill. And that becomes significant. Uh, what temperature is comfortable? Well, it varies from people to people. Uh, often older people and often women need a warmer temperature than younger people and men. That's, that's the physiology. A way to do this is to, to work out the temperature is to have it where it is now and try turning it down one degree. Is it still comfortable or is it not? Keep on doing that process of getting it a bit cooler and a bit cooler until you go, oh, this just isn't right anymore. I'm not, it's not comfortable, it's, it's not warm enough. And at that point, bump it up another degree and use that as your set temperature. Once it's set like that, you don't have to worry about it, you don't have to think about it, but having the thermostat um, set helps reduce that overheating. So, thermostats are very, very handy. So, once again, I just want to reiterate this, which is the difference between heat pumps or normal resistive heaters. Heat pumps are three to four times more efficient than the normal resistive electric heater. That means they're one third to one quarter of the price to run. So, if you have the option between the heat pump or the pure heat, choose the heat pump. Uh, Sometimes heat pumps can get old and clunky and rattly if they're making burring noises. That's not right. It's advisable to try and arrange a service at that point. Uh, portable plug-in heaters should be avoided if they need to be run for any length of time. So A, they're less efficient than a heat pump. B, they're getting charged at a, at a higher tariff for people on quarterly bills. So be really sparing on their use. If you've just got to use it to take the chill off a bedroom for an hour or so, might be okay. But a column heater running for an hour, it might be costing you close to 50 cents. So that's uh, worthwhile keeping an eye on. Uh, wood heaters are a really, um, they provide a lot of heat and they can be a, a very cheap and effective way of heating a home. 
But there's a couple of provisos there about um, the use of wood heaters and, and they go around, A is not smoking out your neighbours, so wood smoke's not so good for our health and we don't want to be putting extra particulates into the environment. And B is making sure the source of our wood is ethical so that we're not uh, raiding endangered habitat for, for our timber. So the key thing for getting a good low emissions, not smoky fire is about having very, very dry timber. So it's about three years is required to dry, dry firewood from being green to being ready to burn. Uh, a good strategy when you're starting a fire is start with lots of uh, small kindling and try and get a hot, bright fire. So the brightness means it's burning ferociously and when it's burning ferociously, it's combusting all of, the, all of the gases and it's reducing the amount of particulates that come out. Modern fires don't allow you to choke them back down to do that smouldering all night burn. That smouldering all night burn is smouldering. It's smoky, it's stinky, and especially in uh, heavily populated urban areas or in valleys, they produce a lot of smoke for your neighbours. So try and burn it fast, hot and bright using dry wood. And with the supply of your firewood, use a reputable uh, supplier who's certified to provide um, ethical firewood. So this is a game we usually play. So you can stick on this slide for as long as you want. And after I've finished talking now, you might want to pause the uh, presentation. Here on the left hand side is we've got the costs of running some appliances. On the right hand side, we've got the appliances, which all been jumbled up. Now, the trick here with this one is to try and match the uh, appliance with the, with the cost to run and the kilowatt hour usage. So if you're approaching this and you want to play this game during the video, is to just remember some of the things I said. Heating's using about half the power. Hot water is using about a quarter. Everything else uses the, the last quarter of the power bill. And the plug-in heaters are expensive to run. Okay, so if you're wanting to solve this, I suggest you uh, pause the video now. Once you're done, we can go on to the next slide. Okay. This is the results from the, from the little, little game we've been playing. And this is showing for delivering 18 kilowatt hours of heat into a room during a day. The plug-in heat is costing a whopping $430 and using 1,671 kilowatt hours. The pure heat, putting the same amount of heat into a room, using the same amount of kilowatt hours, but it's only costing $260 to run. That's the difference between having something on tariff 31, which is plug-in, and tariff 41, which is the hardwired heater. Then we're seeing, coming in after that, is the hot water for the house of four. So it's a roughly about, um, it's around $140 and about 900 kilowatt hours. It's once again, hot water's on a cheaper tariff, generally speaking. After that, we've got the heat pump. And the difference between running the heat pump to, power, uh, to heat the home compared to that plug-in heater, $400 down to $70, massive difference. Other interesting things out of this is we've got uh, the difference between a one-star refrigerator and a four-star refrigerator. The four-star is costing half as much to run. That's a big difference. And similar between halogen downlights and LED downlights, it's $30 compared to $10 to run. That's a massive difference. And then we see right down the bottom is the kettle. Now the kettle's an interesting one. It uses heaps of power for a short amount of time. So if you ran a kettle non-stop, it would be like the plug-in heater up the top, delivering 18 kilowatt hours of heat. Because it just runs for minutes in the day, its actual overall usage is quite low. So now we're on to the, 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 the quarter of the bill, which is uh, hot water. And there's a few things you can do. One is getting more efficient hot water systems, and often that's not possible. You're, got a hot water system and you're stuck with it until it breaks. So that's somewhere between 10 and 20 years um, before it's broken. Or if you're in a rental, you've got not much uh, options there at all. Except for this one here, which is a shower head, um, a low flow shower head. Very simple to change over and take about five minutes. And if you're using less hot water through your shower head, then you're using, you have to make less hot water at your water tank and that will save you money. That's a kind of the best performing value for money um, thing you can do in a house normally. There's a bunch of little tips and tricks you can do with the existing hot water cylinders. So one, 
Some hot water cylinders you can turn, adjust the thermostat down to 60 degrees. Others you'll need an electrician or a plumber to do it in. If you've got to open up any access panels, that's a job for a licensed um, tradesperson. If you, things you can do is put um, insulation lagging around the pipe. So anywhere, if you feel a pipe and it's warm, then that probably needs a lagging and insulating. You also put a whole extra blanket really around the, the hot water tank to help insulate it even further. There's a little products called a valve cozy. They're like a, a, a clamshell that goes around the pressure relief valve and that insulates that area as well. Also low flow uh, washers in your taps and so on can reduce the amount of water, hot water you're using. The next section of the presentation is to do with lighting. And while this is a small overall part of the energy use, there's some really easy wins to be had here. Probably the, the biggest one is, is basically improvements in the type of lighting technology. So we went from the incandescent bulb, we'll say that used 100 watts. Then we've gone to the halogen bulb, that might be using 35 watts. Then we went to the compact fluorescent bulb using 20 watts. And now we're to the LED and we're down to 10 or 12 watts for the same amount of light output. That's a tenfold um, improvement in its efficiency. So any local hardware store will be supplying LED bulbs now. So it's a simple swap and change. It's also people with downlights in their home. There's the halogen downlights installed. A, they use a lot more power than the LED. So three times as much power. They also got a hole cut in your roof and because they get hot, you need to remove the insulation so the houses don't catch on fire. That's a pretty important thing to do. Um, but they also, that cutting the hole, removing the insulation creates a, a hole in your insulation and makes a, a, a gap in the performance of the house. And there's new LEDs which have got a rating which allows them to have insulation placed over the top of them. And that rating is called um, ICF, abutted and covered. So if you check that rating when you're purchasing them, um, there's an opportunity to improve the performance of your insulation as well as saving money on your lighting. Another crucial thing is when you're buying new appliances is they've got advice it's plastered on the front of them and it's the Energy Star rating. And what you're wanting to do if you're purchasing an appliance is get a high star rating. So three should be a minimum uh, you're going for, but the more the better. And a low number, so that energy consumption number, you want that to be as low as possible. Simple, it's there, follow it. Uh, cooking, there's heaps of tips and tricks around cooking. Uh, one is generally to heat up water and what have you. A microwave is more efficient than a hot plate or a kettle. That's, that's an interesting fact. Another thing which I like to just do, which is pretty standard, is just putting a lid on your pot when you're cooking really helps, it speeds up the cooking process, reduces the amount of energy you need. Heaps of simple tips and tricks there. Now, fridges, people are going to groan at this point, do you need more than one fridge? And the, the classic is the beer fridge in the shed. And it appears very crucial, but perhaps it's not. Especially because you might've gone and bought a new four star fridge and put it in the house, but the crappy old one star fridge is now out in the shed rattling away to keep a six pack of beer cool. So perhaps it's having that turned off, perhaps turn it on if you need it, desperately need it, turn it on when you're just having guests around for the barbecue to run it for that short period of time instead of uh, running a whole other fridge that's costing hundreds of dollars a year just to keep a few beers cool. So consider that. And I'm getting close to the end of this section of the presentation but there's a few hidden energy hogs in the house and the key ones are ones that make a a lot of heat consistently over a long period of time. And two of those are uh, tropical fish tanks. So they often have a heater in there that'll be running uh, 24-7, 365 days a year. That can add up to a lot of power. Or coffee machines, especially ones which are sitting there ready for you to press a button to make a, make a pot of coffee. By all means, use the, one, the coffee machine, but perhaps only just turn it on, make a cup of coffee, then turn it off. The other one is area is all the, the PlayStation, the set-top box, the TV, the DVD player, the stereo, all of those things in the corner. And all combined, they often just get kept on because they're, it's just too hard to deal with. And there's a couple of ways to um, 
approach that. One is what they call a master and slave power board. You can buy them from uh, Bunnings or KMD or a hardware store or what have you, or an uh, electronic store. And with those, you can, it's a power board basically. Everything's plugged in and you have one appliance plugged into the master switch and that might be the TV. When you turn the TV off, it switches everything else off on the, that's attached to the power board. Really simple way of, um, of addressing that issue. Okay, we've come to the end of this presentation of uh, the module three of the energy efficiency literacy for frontline community sector workers. This is my contact details, Anton at Sustainable Living Tasmania, slt.org.au. Please feel free to get in touch if you require any more information on any of these topics. Thank you for your attention. Electricity concessions reduce the cost of energy and they're available to a number of, um, a number of uh, consumers, mainly people who are on lower incomes or who have special medical conditions. Some are provided by the state government, some are provided by the Commonwealth government and so you need to apply through the right, um, through the right source to get the right concessions if you're eligible or your clients are eligible. The first one and the most the broadest one is the electricity concession and this is available to anyone who is on a pensioner card, a veterans affairs card, the IMI card which is immigration visa E I think um, and also healthcare cards and you apply for this through Aurora you just have to provide evidence of the pension card or, or healthcare card to get the entitlement to that concession. It's about $480 a year so it's definitely worth applying for if you're eligible. The second set of concessions are to do with health, health conditions. The state government provides a life support con concession and a medical cooling and heating concession. These two, the amount varies according to what you actually need to do. So the particular piece of equipment that you need for life support or the particular range of temperatures that you need to maintain in your home in order to uh, support your wellbeing if you have particular medical conditions are going to affect the amount of concession that's available to you. The way you apply for these ones is also through Aurora, but you need to get the medical documentation from your medical practitioner to say, this is the equipment that you need, or these are the, this is the condition for which you need special medical or special heating or cooling conditions. The, the kinds of things that you might have, for, there are conditions like multiple sclerosis, but your medical practitioner will be able to help you and Aurora will be able to provide you the information about those concessions or you can find information in the state government's discounts and concessions handbook. There's also a Commonwealth uh, concession, which is the essential medical equipment payment. This one's also available through uh, to people who are on um, pensions and, and benefits and th available through Centrelink. And this is about this is about whether you need essential medical equipment to maintain your health and well-being, and Centrelink can help you with that one. Again, it's going to vary according to the precise nature and cost of running the equipment that you need. And the final concession that's available, again through the state government, but this time through DHHS, which is the Department of Health and Human Services, is the heating allowance. And the heating allowance is an amount of $56 a year, paid in two instalments of $28, usually in May and September. Um, and it's just a little supplement to cope with the costs of heating in winter. Now we're going to talk about payment options. So for your electricity bill, for most people the bill is going to come quarterly and be a big bill every three months and a particularly big bill in winter time. So it's important to know how you can cope with that bill, what the different payment options are available to help deal with that sort of bulky or, or, or lumpy or dramatic cost every so often because this will help to manage the cost of electricity. The first and probably the most commonly used uh, payment system um, for people who are on Centrelink payments is called Centrepay. And what this means is that Centrelink, when it delivers the payment to you, takes the money for a particular bill out before you get the money. And this can be arranged for your Aurora bill too, along with a lot of other different kinds of bills. Um, the advantage of that is that the uh, money comes out before the money goes into your bank, so it's always going to be done. But it's also a self-managed system. If you want to change your arrangement with Centrelink about your centre payments, your centre pay payments, um, then you can just go back to Centrelink and make that make that adjustment yourself. 
A second option that you have to smooth out the cost of electricity over time is called Easy Pay. And this one comes from Aurora. And what Aurora will do for you is look at the cost of your bills over the previous 12 months and say, well, okay, your winter bill was twice as high as your summer bill, for example, but across the year, if we spread out the cost evenly, it would be um, this much per quarter or this much per month or this much per fortnight. And they will be able to assist you to say, well, this is what I need to pay and I can pay it on a regular basis and cover the cost of my electricity bill without getting that bill shock that comes with a really hefty bill in winter or, at, or really at any time of the year when it's three monthly. Um, the downside of that one or the challenge with that one is if you haven't lived in the house for 12 months, they're not going to be able to give you that accurate billing information. So it only works if you've got a, a, a stable residence for that amount of time. But another way that you can manage the cost of your electricity rather than paying it as a lump sum every three months is to make ongoing payments off, off your own back as, as and when you can. And you can do this just by taking um, a copy of your bill or a copy of your account number to a post office or service Tasmania outlet. And you can pay whatever you like at whatever time you like through this means. And this is quite good for people who have um, changes in their income over time and want a lot of flexibility and when they pay the extra money. So one way to manage this if you're helping clients or even helping yourself is to actually take from your Aurora bill, cut out that little account number and then tape it to a bit of cardboard or laminate it so you can just carry it in your wallet because then any time that you want to do it you don't have to think did I remember the bill did I not remember the bill do I know my account number you've just got a little card any time you want to pay some extra off your bill and save yourself the trouble when it comes in three months time um, you can do that at your own at your own discretion another option and this is one of the ones that's that's um, kind of put front and center on the Aurora bill is direct debit and when you use a direct debit system, uh, the money comes out of your, you make an arrangement so that Aurora can debit your account uh, and you work out the appropriate amount of money to be taken out of your account to pay Aurora every so often. There is a small um, discount that Aurora provides for this. Uh, there's a couple of traps with it though, and particularly for low income vulnerable clients, it's probably not the one we'd recommend. The reason for that is if you uh, don't have enough money in your account and Aurora is authorised to deduct the money from your account, then the bank might charge you a fee and Aurora might also charge you um, for a, a, a dishonour of, of not making the payment that you said you'd be able to make. So it works if you've got enough money in your account to buffer you against those possibilities. Not so good if you're on a low income and you're you're not always going to have enough money um, in the account to cover it. You can set up a recurrent payment through your own bank system and this is just saying well I'm, I, I want my bank to pay out this amount of money. Um, if you do that it doesn't have the, the downside of the, um, the direct debit system. It's, it just won't make the payment if the money's not there to be made. So you can manage a recurrent payment from your own bank side and set that up online if you're able to do that. Another way to manage the cost of electricity is through the pay-as-you-go pay system that Aurora provides in certain households. This is currently available in some houses and they're not actually putting new Aurora pay-as-you-go meters in at the moment. So it only works if that system's already established in your household. And um, what you do there is you just pay you pay ahead with a little card and you can pay it at your local grocer or news agent or somewhere else and then you can just top it up as, as you need to over time. There are lots of other payment options. You can pay uh, as much as you like or as little as you like um, through, um, through ringing up Aurora, through working online, through using bill pay or post bill pay, but mainly those options are for people who are just paying their three monthly bill when they're ready to pay it. We're now going to talk about payment plans. Under the, uh, the, national, the national energy rules, retailers must offer payment plans. And when they offer a payment plan, the retailer needs to consider the household's electricity usage, how much money is owed, and the customer's capacity to pay. What we've learnt from talking to people through this project is that the retailers tend to be very good at understanding the household's electricity usage and they're also very good at understanding how much money is owed. They're less good at looking after the customer's capacity to pay, which is understandable, that's probably not their field of expertise. If you're 
supporting a client that's the critical one that you probably have most capacity to support the client with the customer's capacity to pay and our recommendation is always that if you're assisting a client before they start to talk to Aurora about their payment plan start to talk to them first about what can they afford to pay on a, on a fortnightly basis or whatever the basis is that, that they want to negotiate. If you go into that discussion with Aurora knowing what your parameters are, what your client's parameters are, you're in a better place to have that conversation. Payment plans arise when someone's already got a debt. That is, they've got, they're having trouble paying the bill that they owe to Aurora. Um, and so the principal thing there is to say, well, how do I get out of this situation and also manage in time for the next bill? The payment plan is supposed to assist the person to do it. And if, you, if, they, if Aurora thinks that you should be paying more than is really affordable for that client or for, or for yourself, um, you're just going to get into more trouble. You're going to sink deeper into a hole. So do not agree to a payment plan that you cannot afford. They should be receptive to understanding that, but sometimes that's a difficult conversation. Think about it, prepare for it, and work out how to manage it ahead of time. When you have trouble paying a bill to Aurora, there is a hardship program that should help you. This is the Aurora Yes program. It stands for Your Energy Support. It's all, all energy retailers are required to have a hardship program, and this is the one that's been approved for Aurora by the Australian Energy Regulator. What it involves is a specialist trained team, and they're expertise is to help people with hardship or financial difficulties when they're paying their energy bills. What Again, what we've learnt through our conversations with community sector workers through the workshops is that typically you'll do better if you can get on to a conversation with a member of the YES team than the standard uh, phone service that's available to any, any customer. And that's, that makes sense because they are the specialists in the area. They will provide assistance through the YES program for Aurora Gas and Electricity customers. So even if it's a gas bill your client's having trouble with, Aurora will still help, so that's worth knowing. What they are intending to do is help you with an affordable energy plan. Let me rephrase that. A afford an affordable payment plan. Again, it's got to be something that works for the consumer. They'll be able to provide information and advice on energy use and sometimes they'll offer additional assistance talking about energy efficiency, uh, how much energy you're using and how you can manage that. We would hope that the information in these workshops is also of assistance to people who are having trouble managing their, the costs of their energy because you can manage it through uh, reducing how much you use and hopefully not compromising your household wellbeing while you do that. If someone's having real trouble paying their bills um, the community sector also manages energy relief payments which are specifically for energy, electricity and gas bills. They're provided by a variety of emergency relief organisations throughout Tasmania. Um, with, there's a list including the Salvation Army, St Vincent de Paul, Uniting Care, the City Missions in Launceston and Hobart, Colony 47, the Windara Centre up in Smithton and there's a variety of others. So if you're assisting a client you probably have access to the network that will tell you who these su support services are for the Energy Hardship Fund. If you're on your own start by looking into um, maybe your neighbourhood house will have information or ring, contact any of those um, relief organisations and they'll be able to help you. There are some constraints on it, there's a limit to how much payment you'll be able to get within a calendar year and, and a few other bells and whistles, but they are specifically designed to help with energy hardship and will help you to stay connected if you're having trouble with the bill. Another way that the emergency relief services can help is if you're on a payment plan to help you to maintain it. Because the trick with a payment plan once you've agreed to it with Aurora is that um, you've got to stay engaged and you've got to keep making the payments according to the plan that you've agreed to. If, you've, if you default on that payment plan, they'll give you two chances and then they'll start to look at disconnection. If you're still on the payment plan on the YES program, they can't disconnect you and they won't. So the way to manage that, there's lots of different options that you've got, but the critical, the critical message is to stay, connect, stay engaged with Aurora. If they know that you're engaged and that, or that the client is engaged and they know that you or the client is making every effort to, to 
uh, comply with the expectations, they're much, much more able to help you. They're much, if you drop out and you stop contacting them, tempting as it is to not open those letters that you don't want to know what's in them, if you drop out of that connection, then they don't know where you're at and what your circumstances are. They think you're not compliant and they will sometimes take the action of disconnecting you if you default twice on the plan. If you're engaged in the plan, they won't disconnect you. That's their commitment. So one of the ways to stay uh, engaged and managing your payments on a payment plan is to use emergency relief. So what happens here is you can get some assistance with other aspects in your life, maybe, maybe with some other costs that you've got, education costs, or some clothing issues or food issues or furniture issues if you if if that's what you need which will free up some money and some cash so that you can continue to make the payments on the plan or the bill because if you don't you lose your electricity and you just get further behind so staying connected and staying engaged with Aurora's payment plans are very closely intertwined when you are having difficulty paying your bills or your clients are having difficulty paying your bills, the critical thing to think about is how do you, how do you get the information and support you, you need, not just for the emergency support, but also in an ongoing way. And this is where financial counselling is really important. The financial counsellors provide advocacy and support and information to assist people who have financial difficulty. There are, um, they're going to help with personal finances, with debt, with budgeting, but they're also really, really excellent advocates. Again, what we understand about the, um, the impact that assistance from financial counsellors can have is that uh, once they get involved to support you with Aurora, often things will go better for you. Um, there are waiting lists sometimes for financial counsellors, but they're worth waiting for and they're worth being engaged with. Again, it's an indicator to Aurora that you're trying to manage and solve the problems that got you behind in the bills in the first place. So they look very favourably on engagement with financial counsellors. It's really important to note though that financial counselling is a very specific kind of service. It's generally provided through the not-for-profit sector in, in Tasmania, mostly Anglicare but some of the other services provide financial counselling. It is not the same as financial advice, it is not the same as financial advisor and it's not the same as debt counselling. Those are different services and if your client is a person on a low income, a vulnerable consumer, then those other services typically aren't going to be as useful or appropriate for them. They will not necessarily help you with your, with your um, energy costs and with your uh, discussions with Aurora. What you want is the financial counselling service. Um, they're the ones that, that are beneficial to you. The NIL scheme, the No Interest Loan Scheme, uh, is as, as the name suggests, it provides no interest loans to people who are eligible and it allows you to cover the essentials of life. So the kinds of things Niels will help you with are things to do with transport, your car rego, your car tyres, sometimes they'll help you with white goods, new fridges, sometimes washing machines, education essentials, particularly computers are expensive, medical and dental services. They'll also help you with, um, they'll also help you with energy efficiency items. And from time to time, and at the time of recording this, which is April 2017, um, there is a special element in NILS, which is the energy saver loans and subsidies. What they'll do here is they will not only loan money at no interest for energy efficient appliances, they will also give you a 50% subsidy. And that again is thanks to the state government for supporting the NILS scheme to do this. The 50% subsidy means that if you were to shift from um, an expensive heater to a more energy efficient heating system like a heat pump, half of the cost will be subsidised through the NILS scheme if you're an eligible applicant for the, for the NILS loan. That's definitely worth doing and it's worth keeping an eye on for yourself and for your clients because it makes a huge difference in the long run to what the cost of your energy is going to be over time. To manage the bill you have to manage the cost of energy um, and bringing that down by installing energy efficient appliances is always a good idea. If you've done everything you can to be as efficient and, and, and frugal as you can be in your energy use and you've done the best you can to manage your energy bill and you've done everything that you can to make it right with Aurora but things have gone wrong, you'll find yourself in the space of complaints and disputes. This is inevitable in any system things will go wrong. What do you do? Well first up, 
you start at the lowest level that you can you raise the complaint or the issue with the company that's with Aurora in most cases might be with um, uh, Tasgas but typically for most of us it's going to be Aurora let them know what the problem is and if the person you're speaking to is not helpful to you ask to speak to a supervisor or manager that is to say the, f the first step is is contact the company the second step is escalation always keep notes of what conversations you have make a note of when you try it when you contacted them if you're on hold for too long make a note that you tried to make a contact on that day at that time and how long you waited on the phone to get hold of them sometimes there's um a, you know there's a a reason why they couldn't get back to you quickly sometimes it'll just help to say i've really really tried i tried over this amount of time i tried this many times um, when you speak to a person make sure you know the name of that person or the reference number of the call because they can go back and check that as well and it just means you've got all of the documentation of the efforts that you've made to resolve the dispute in good faith. If all else fails and you've tried a number of times to contact the company and you've got nowhere resolving the dispute and you think that you're, re you're being reasonable and they're being unhelpful to you, the next step is to take the complaint to the Energy Ombudsman. This is a free and independent service. One thing that you can do is before you escalate to the Ombudsman, you can advise the person that you're speaking to, by now it is the, um, the supervisor or manager at Aurora, you can advise them that that's a course of action that you are, you are prepared to take. Sometimes that, um, that makes them take you more seriously. The other thing you can be doing here is um, getting advice and advocacy assistance uh, to do this from um, one of your, your community sector service providers because sometimes it helps to have an advocate on site. Much easier to advocate for someone else than it is to stand up for yourself in these, in these dispute situations sometimes. So, hopefully you can avoid disconnection, hopefully you can avoid complaints and disputes, hopefully everything is going to stay on track to stay connected and the the set of tips that we have here just summarises what we've talked about before. Effectively, if you're helping someone to stay connected, the kind of advice they need to have on hand is the following. First up, work out before you talk to the retailer to set up a payment plan, work out first what is the amount that you can afford to pay. They ought to be taking that into account. Um, but it helps them to know from your side what you can afford to pay. And if you need to stay below a certain amount to manage the rest of your financial commitments, then you need to not agree to an amount that's higher than that. No matter what Aurora thinks you can afford to pay, you and your client know what that amount is and you need to know it and stick to it. It's important again to stay engaged with, with Aurora, your, your energy retailer. If you don't stay engaged with them, they're not going to look favourably upon you to support your request for extensions on payment or, or any other consideration that you want from them. So if they know ahead of time, it's much easier for them to say yes to you. If you need to uh, defer a payment, you're going to be a bit late because of some other issues that have arisen, or if you need to miss a payment for a particular uh, set of circumstances, if you tell them ahead of time, it's much easier for them to fix that than to kind of reverse a defaulted payment, right? They can do it ahead of time is better than behind time. So even though it's an uncomfortable conversation, if you know you've got to have the conversation, sooner rather than later makes the whole thing run more smoothly. Again, in terms of staying engaged, the advice is always communicate and stay in communication. Always, if they send you some information, open it, read it, consider it, or take it to someone who can help you to understand it. Sometimes they say things and you don't know what they mean, get some help and support and advice on that. If they're calling you, if they're sending you text messages, respond to those things. Stay engaged. Always respond. Again, don't agree to something that you can't afford. They might think you can afford it. You're the one who knows the truth of that. You've got to, you've got to stick to your guns on that one. Again, the reason is if you fail, if you are on a payment plan or on the hardship program, if you default twice within a 12-month period, if, if the plan fails, then they can disconnect you. If you stay engaged, they can't, they can't disconnect you while, you while you're staying on the plan. So staying on the plan, staying in communication, staying engaged is really the best way to stay connected. If you're going to miss the payment, let them know ahead of time. Sooner is always better. The problem won't go away, but the solution is easier to achieve if you do it in a timely fashion. Again, the advice that we 
cannot emphasize too strongly is about keeping a record. If you keep track of all the attempts that you've made to act in good faith on your own behalf or on your client's behalf, you're in much better position if you have to take it to uh, a dispute or complaint, but you're also in much better conversation with them because you say, well, actually, I know I've done all these things. I know I've stayed engaged. And if they, if they haven't kept track in the right way, then you're on good grounds. It's not just your word against theirs. You've got a record and it's worth having that. Escalate if you need to. If things aren't going well, this Aurora has agreed, it's signed up to, to an agreement to treat customers in hardship uh, with the right consumer protections. So if you can't get the outcome that you need to get, escalate, take it up to a manager or a supervisor, and then if, if that doesn't work, contact the Tasmanian NG Ombudsman to get their assistance to find a reasonable resolution. If you've got disconnected, then the next step is gonna be find a way to get reconnected. Typically what this is, so typically this involves an amount up front and agreement to a payment plan to resolve whatever the debt is, issue is. Sometimes the Aurora will negotiate the up, upfront payment if a customer is in hardship. Again, the more you look like a person who is going to get it right into the future, the more sympathetic Aurora is likely to be. So showing yourself to be engaged, showing yourself to be uh, using all the resources that you can to stay connected and to stay uh, ahead of your energy costs is going to help you. The payment plan is typically going to cover the debt that you've got but also your ongoing usage so they're going to want you to be able to pay the debt you've got by the time the next bill's due and this might not be as long as you'd like it to be because the problem may only leave you a few, uh, 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 an amount of time shorter than three months till the next bill's due but you might be able to persuade them particularly if you can get some advocates on side um, to extend that so it's not over the next billing cycle quarterly but it might give you two billing cycles to, to catch up the debt. You, you mustn't agree to payment plans that are unaffordable. All that will do is dig the hole deeper. So they ought to understand that, um, again, they've got some obligations under the national energy law to do that. Um, but you may also need some advocacy support to persuade, to persuade uh, to negotiate the right outcome. This is where a community services worker or a financial counsellor can assist a client and it's critical to get that advocacy support if that's what you need. Once you have been disconnected and reconnected, they can charge you additional fees. That's one of the reasons why avoiding disconnection, not just because of the um, additional inconvenience and discomfort in your house when you haven't got any electricity is a really bad outcome for a client, but also because it's gonna cost you more money to get reconnected. That again sets you back further. So disconnection is the, is the root of last resort. And to, and to be fair, Aurora would really prefer not to disconnect people because it's better for them, for clients to, and, and consumers to stay engaged and to stay connected. So do what you can to stay connected. Last resort, get reconnected as soon as possible with the right support and advocacy.